very excited that so many of our outside discussants today are deeply connected to Penn and in particular tied to the Mitchell Center. And that's especially um, the situation we have for us today because in addition to having Brendan Lee, Caitlin Mintala, and Shemat Sakankwo, we have Matt Schaefer joining us as our discussant. Matt was himself a uh, Mitchell Center postdoctoral fellow uh, last year um, as part of the free speech uh, program. He's the most outstanding, engaged, wonderful uh, member. Uh, he is currently a member of the School of Social Science at the Institute for Advanced Study, a remarkable position to be had so early in your academic career. Um, and uh, he received his PhD from Yale in 2020. Next year, we'll be joining the faculty of uh, Florida International University. And um, Matt's research examines the politics of language and the language of politics and contemporary technological capitalism. He's completing a book project, which is a critical history of contemporary debates about how the term violence should be defined in political theory and deployed in political rhetoric. And again, it was awesome working with you last year. You made a big presence uh, in the Mitchell Center, and we're very lucky to have you joining us again today. So now we'll turn things over to the students who will go in a certain order. Would you have maybe the slides up, Sarah? Yeah, um, you know, Johnson, you want to start this oh, up? I think Great. Oops. Okay. And uh, Sarah, can you show her? Oh, yeah. Oh, this is a loud mic. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Oh, is it like fitting to the screen here? Hmm. Is there a way to like make it take up the whole screen? I think if you oh, get a little bigger, if you do the uh, uh, that, yeah. It's fine. Um, let's put it back to this. Oh, I feel like I messed it up again. Okay. Um, so I'll start off by saying good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. My name is Chinaza Ruth Akonkwo. I'm a senior and graduate student. Um, I'll be graduating in a couple weeks, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, so I'll just start my project um, talking about it. It's called Igbo and Wet Eze Towards an Indigenous Igbo Concept of Democracy. And so Africa is not the first region one thinks of when reflecting on the nature and tradition of democracy, or the first region where one searches for inspirational representations of governmental institutions. Instead, whenever Africa and democracy are mentioned together, it is usually to question whether Africans have and are capable of practicing democracy, or whether they've ever had a complex or viable governmental system. This project is about indigenous evil political systems, which is usually summarized in the statement, Igbo Enwe Eze, or the Igbo have no king, a saying used to convey the democratic nature of political institutions in Igbo society. Ooh, how do I go? Oh, no. How do I um, click? To yeah. Um, hold on. Okay, hitting enter. Okay. 
Um, the objective of my project, Igbo Enwa Eze, towards an indigenous Igbo conception of democracy, is to first argue that we ought to deconstruct the Eurocentric idea that Africa can be consolidated and packaged into one uniform presentation with a disregard for the indigenous institutions across the continent. I try to accomplish this by exploring Igbo political institutions, practice, and thought, exploring unique formations of gendered institutions, even with a, within a self proclaimed democracy, detailing the complexity of the Igbo political system as a result, and asserting the presence and viability of a distinct Igbo political tradition and democracy. My goal was for this research was to uncover an often ignored and understudied world of indigenous Igbo political theory and practice, and to inspire other researchers, especially those on the African continent, to turn the spotlight towards what existed before European colonization. I want to stress the importance of the distinctiveness of Igbo culture and of all the indigenous cultures on the African continent. M. A. Onwedru Wu's notes, the concept of culture area is an anthropological one based on the empirical observation that at any given period, cultures have spatial or geographical distribution of traits, complexes, or patterns. Hence, while it is probable that between the 14th and 17th centuries, the Belgians and the French had significant cultural elements in common, it is improbable that the Germans and the Indians had a had at that same period any significant culture elements in common. In the same way, while it is most likely that the Ngwa Ibo and the Anang Ethic or the Insuka Ibo and the Idoma of the 18th and 19th centuries had certain significant cultural elements in common, it is probably, it is improbably that they had any common cultural traits with the Hausa, the Kanuri, or the Yoruba. The Hausa or the Kanuri or the Yoruba are geographically and so culturally distinct from the Igbo. Um, I mentioned that because the Hausa and the Yoruba, along with Igbos, are one of the three major ethnic groups of Nigeria. So this map is a part of Princeton, the, the map to the left is a part of Princeton's early coll a collection of early maps of Africa and was created in 1584 by Abraham Otelius. It was the standard map of Africa at the time. We don't often see maps that reflect an Africa before its partition. And even though this map already reflects a number of European influences and doesn't reflect how people's indigenous to the continent would think of the landmass, I still think it's an important image. You can also see the place names of numerous towns along the coast and in the interior that represent different kingdoms and ethnic configurations that are no longer present after the Berlin Conference, although large empty spaces are there. I'm going to briefly touch on the Berlin Conference of 1884 to 1885, which was organized by Otto von Bismarck, a German chancellor to regulate European colonization and trade on the continent. While this was a major influence in dividing the continent, other agreements that occurred before and after the conference was also instrumental in sectioning the region. This decision effectively destroyed indigenous political institutions, and in the colonization of the continent, Europeans developed their own notion of political regimes and systems meant to reflect their political institutions in Europe. Europeans wanted Africans to serve as colonies and economic producers while also reflecting a change or development in political institutions. This meant that Africans were to reflect notions of the nation state, an ever evolving police state, and other forms of political institutions and formations uh, that resulted under the various administrative systems put in place across the continent. So um, in terms of methodology, in order to conduct this research, I examined the mix of primary and secondary writing materials, as well as oral sources that detail important political institutions and values among Igbos. This project relied on what was left behind by Igbo people in a variety of mediums, such as proverbs, dance, archaeological findings, and performances. I also used colonial documents such as newspapers, ethnographies, records, old photographs, and drawings, maps and novels written by white missionaries and colonizers. For the sake of time, I will only read two excerpts from my project to give a glimpse into the complexity of pre-colonial Igbo politics. <clears throat> 
The, de the de declarative yet complex statement, Ibo Enwe Eze, which literally translates to Ibo has no king, reflects the political and social value of autonomy and self-rule held by Ibos. This statement has generated much discussion among Ibo scholars, given the apparent contradiction found in some political organizations across Ibo land, such as the Inri and Aro kingdoms. The Inri and Aro Ibos practice a democratic monarchy strongly rooted in gerontocracy. This was one of the two main pre-colonial Igbo po political institutions, with the other being a direct village democracy. The power of the Eze, or the king, in pre-colonial Igbo democratic monarchies were effectively curtailed by a council of elders and the overall approval and respect for members of the village. The pre-colonial Igbo expression of kingship differed significantly from the other ethnic groups in the surrounding area. Michael Onyedika Nualatu notes, in other words, Eze as operated among the Igbo does not equate to king in the manner that Oba, as in the Benin kingdom or the Yoruba kingdom, kingdoms of southern Nigeria, nor is the power attributed to Eze and Igbo comparable to those of the emirs or sultans in the northern parts of Nigeria. Eze is not and has never been a monarch who holds absolute power over his subjects. In fact, he is a leader servant to the Igbo society. While scholars have expressed disagreement as to the origins of kingship in pre-colonial Igbo politics, given the prevailing appearance of direct democracies across Igbo land, its appearance in certain Igbo subcultures still aligns with fundamental principles of autonomy and restraint against tyranny found in pre-colonial Igbo political theory. Now, the village republic represents what most contemporary Igbos imagine when reflecting on political um, traditions and formations of the past. The Igbos arranged themselves in, based on notions of patrilineal and matrilineal villages and village groups. More specifically, the Igbos gave social and political power to the Umuna and Obodo in defining and organizing socio-political standards and ob obligations. These villages um, that the Igbo people lived in range from hundreds of people to thousands in more densely populated areas. And within these villages, there were village assemblies where all men and women could speak freely and argue for their wishes, and decisions were made by the overall group consensus or majority rule. This form of political discourse was based on the treasured ability to speak well and convince others through sophisticated linguistic parables and proverbs. The village assembly and the practice of discourse argument and then consensus found in all political organizations in pre-colonial Igbo society reflect the nature of an indigenous form of Igbo democracy not practiced anywhere else. The pre-colonial Igbo system was a direct or pure democracy. Direct democracy or pure democracy is a form of democracy in which the electorate decides on policy initiatives without elected representatives as proxies. So in the Igbo context, since everyone in the village is a citizen and like a part of the village and a family member, everyone gets to decide. While the theory and practice of direct democracy and participation was the core of many well, was the core of work of many theorists and philosophers such as Rousseau and John Stuart Mills, pre-colonial Igbos practiced it. And while pre-colonial Igbos practice a truly functional expression of democracy, both men and women exerting political power and authority, hierarchical relationships remained within all aspects of Igbo society. Gloria Chukli notes that relationships were determined by age, experience, ability, marital status, and rights of initiation. Individuals earned power, authority, and respect as a result of their moral probity, leadership charisma, persuasive oratory, heroic military service, or gallant prowess, as well as intellectual and business acumen. The flexibility within the traditional Igbo gender structure did not mean that traditional Igbos were progressive in gender ideology. Given the positions of economic and sociopolitical power that Igbo women have inhabited, scholars of Africa have assumed that Igbo women and other ethnic configurations in Africa practiced a form of gender e equality. However, traditional Igbo society was still deeply patriarchal and afforded power to gendered males in society. While wealth and talent are key components in gaining no notoriety in Igbo society, the status of a woman is intrinsically tied to their ability and success in giving birth as well as their transition into marriage. And there's this saying, Ogori and Wagi, the 
Onwegi Oluoko, which means a woman without a husband is without a voice. So within these dual sex socio-political structures that evil people practice, gender and men and women manage their own responsibilities and duties within their socio-political organizations. And these gendered institutions existed in a parallel manner that complemented each other rather than female organizations being completely subordinate. For gendered women, the dual sex socio-political organization was another tool of democracy serving as a check against male patriarchal power. Um, so just to round up and not take too, many t too much time, um, my, so the implications of this research, um, I think that there's just so much to learn by rediscovering pre-colonial Igbo culture, and I'm so grateful to the Center for the ability to do that through politics. Pre-colonial Igbo's practice a vibrant and complex political system for 6,000 years before the arrival of Europeans. Um, and because of that, this paper is just a brief introduction into an extremely intricate political system. As I mentioned earlier, I really hope that this work and the scholarship I produce inspires and encourages others to reflect and reveal the complex cultures that existed before Europe's global domination and colonization. Thank you so much. All right, hi everyone. Um, my name is Caitlin Rental, and I'm a senior at Penn studying PPE. Um, I'm really excited to be here with you all today. This is something that I've been thinking about for even longer than the year I've been at the Andrew Mitchell Center. Um, and so I'm really excited to present it. And thank you to the center for the opportunity to really dive deep into this question um, this year. So I'm going to walk through my table of contents a little bit. So first, I want to talk about um, the basic structure and defining it, and specifically its significance and the role in society. Um, next, I want to talk about big tech as a macro institution of the basic structure. I'll talk a little bit more what I mean by that in a bit. And then finally, talking about the implications of my argument. What does it mean to call big tech a macro institution of this basic structure? What are the policy implications and what are the philosophical implications? Uh, so first, going to my first category. Um, this lovely man here, as most of you probably know, is John Rawls. Um, in 1971, in his seminal work, A Theory of Justice, John Rawls first coins the term the basic structure. And according to Rawls, the role of institutions that belong to the basic structure is to secure just background conditions against which the actions of individuals and associations take place. Um, so to Rawls, these basic structure institutions are made up of formal institutions of the state, of the government, or largely associated with the government. Um, you know, the political constitution, legal systems, the economy as it's conceived by the state. You know, this debate of whether or not the family is considered part of the basic structure, that'll get briefly touch on a little bit just for tangential purposes, but for our sake, we're going to focus on Rawls's general understanding of the basic structure as institutions of largely formed by the state. And why is the basic structure so important? Um, the institutions that make up the basic structure distribute the main benefits and burdens of social life. Who will receive social recognition, who will have basic rights, who op what opportunities we get to work. Um, what the distribution of income and wealth would be, and so on. They determine every part of some individual who lives in a society's basic rights, you know? The opportunities that we think we are able to pursue, the relationships that we might be able to have in our lives, almost every aspect of an individual life. And that's why it's a really critical part of determining, you know, um, it's a really critical part of determining what institutions are a part of this so-called basic structure framework. <clears throat> 
Um, so components of the basic structure, related to that, there are two ways of understanding the unique nature of the institutions that belong to the basic structure. These are kind of the two main ways that political philosophers post Rawls have conceived of his basic structure argument. So first, the profound effects account. Um, this profound effects account basically says, you know, institutions that are part of the basic structure are a part of this basic structure because they influence every part of people's lives. You know, they impact nearly every single part of how we operate, what op jobs we have, et cetera, um, everything I've detailed prior. Um, and then there's also this coercive account, which I personally find extremely interesting, is Rawls is saying that, well, in order for the basic structure institutions to adequately secure just background conditions, it must be coercive in nature. So think of the government manda mandating taxes. Um, this coercive nature is necessary because, you know, we don't, we like to think we would act in a good will, good will, you know, helping our fellow people, fellow citizens um, in distributing a fair and just life. But in reality, there needs to be some coercive element, largely through the state, that really helps organize the society in this just and fair way. Um, therefore, because of these profound and coercive nature of these institutions, Rawls argues they must be democratically arranged. Um, as the people, this idea of popular sovereignty, we give basic structure institutions the ability to have profound and coercive effects over us, so that they therefore must be arranged in a way that reflects justice as fairness. So therefore, they must be democratically arranged. Um, okay. So basic structures and corporations. What does Rawls say about that? He, Rawls never specifically gets into it too much. Um, Rawls does not consider corporations a part of the basic structure, however, and this is largely, we, you know, we can largely think of that because Rawls has been critical of other thinkers who have proposed other institutions as a part of the basic structure. So, for example, the famous philosopher Susan Mahler Ogin has, um, you know, said that family should be part of the basic structure, and Rawls has pushed back a little bit against her thinking. Um, but it's fairly clear that Rawls considered corporations an association that acts against the backdrop of the basic structure, rather than the part of the basic structure itself. Um, while Rawls could potentially agree that corporations have a profound and pervasive impact on individuals as well as society, um, he would likely argue that it's not sufficient for inclusion of the basic structure. Corporations must prove to be legally coercive as well. Um, and since, you know, he would argue that individuals, at least in ideal theory, are able to freely exit corporations, I think this point can be debated. People like Elizabeth Anderson also thinks this point can be debated, but uh, corporations are not sufficiently co coercive. Um, so that's just a, a summary and overview of Rawls's account of corporations and basic structure. Next, we'll be talking about big tech as a macro institution, the basic structure, why the focus on big tech. So what is big tech and why the focus on technology? For my purposes, I refer to big tech as the four largest technology companies, um, Apple, Amazon, Meta, Facebook, um, and Alphabet slash Google. Um, these have replaced the energy giants of the early 2000s to really top the NASDAQ stock index. Um, there are a lot of statistics and data points that I could tell you to just really emphasize the sheer size of big tech. Um, for example, let's see one here. Um, at this time when I had written this presentation, Apple profits just from the past three months was tw near 22 billion, was near double the combined annual profits of the five largest US airlines in pre-pandemic 2019. Um, you know, Apple's worth over three trillion dollars. Um, the sheer size of big tech can't be, you know, understated. And the influence of big tech on liberal democratic institutions has been extensively written about in the past few years. Everything from the spread of disinformation and fake news on Facebook during the 2016 presidential election, to investigations of pri concerns of privacy regarding big tech, to the deplatforming of President Trump um, after the January 6th insurrection. All of this to say is that tech is increasingly becoming a massive, massive part of our lives and increasingly affecting these democratic institutions that I believe you know, make up the basic structure. Um, so big tech as a macro institution. Back in last March, my junior year March, I really got hold of this idea. I thought it was really interesting. I kind of wanted to think, back when I was like thinking about this still, I was like, okay, 
it seems like big tech based on its profound coercive effects are part of the basic structure, right? Like they're equal to the government in their influence, specifically in areas like free speech and privacy where I focused on. Um, however, after months of research and thinking about the idea more, I actually came to f argue that big tech should be conceived as more of a macro institution, maybe even more influential in you know, non-ideal theory um, than Rawls's conception of the basic structure. They have coercive and profound effects stronger than the government institutions that make up this Rawlsian basic structure. Uh, this point can definitely be debated, but I think it's really served as an interesting framework and case study to think about big tech in this new light. Uh, so just to go really quickly about some of the arguments why I think big tech is more profound as well as more co coercive. Um, on the profound side, big tech has systematically acted to weaken the state's ability to fair wages and crushing efforts to unionize. Um, this, obviously, I think the most prominent example of big tech union busting is Amazon, although recently, of course, you know, Amazon, there's, there's been a few unions uh, to start coming out of Amazon, which is a really, really exciting development. But nevertheless, they have still, Amazon has consistently and continuously prevented the creation of unions within its company while simultaneously avoiding legal liability. There are many case studies about this. Um, and working conditions, you know, within Amazon have been highly critical. Um, as warehouse employees cite unfair short breaks, high injury rates, arbitrary firings at any point. Um, and then to focus on issues of privacy and free speech specifically, big tech has systematically weakened the privacy and speech rights of individuals by purposely undermining the state where its regulations are weak, specifically in the United States. I think you, know, you could argue differently in other areas and regions. Um, but for example, when the FTC tried to regulate Google over privacy violations found in Google Street View, which turned into like uh, you know the Google Maps thing where you can see kind of like videos of everything or pictures of everything when you go onto Google Maps. Um, Google simply steamrolled the agency with lawyers and resources. There's a really great case study of this in uh, The Agent Surveillance Capitalism by Shoshana Zuboff where she talks about this really interesting phenomenon. Um, highly recommend you guys check it out. And then also on the free speech side, there's been a lot of new developments here as well with Elon Musk buying Twitter. I know Twitter's not part of that big tech framework I've described, but I think it's ex also extremely relevant. Um, but for example, while the Supreme Court has struck down almost all state regulation of hate speech and political speech, private tech corporations like Facebook are able to freely ban speech as they see fit. Um, in our society where speech environment is largely dependent on access to those private social medias, media platforms, the First Amendment, and by extension, the state, is no longer profoundly shaping individual free speech rights. Um, of course, things always change, and you know, the legal system is always moving, but I think there's been a lot of scholars working on this really interesting idea of how our speech platforms and our er you know, areas of public speech are increasingly becoming privatized. Um, then I finally wanted to quickly say that all of this, you know, I focus mostly on privacy and free speech, but with the pandemic, I think we've all seen how tech has increased its profound and coercive capabilities, um, you know, through this forced, you know, online digital world we've had to live the past two years. And so my argument that big tech um, is going to become only more profound and pervasive, um, I think, is telling in the age of the pandemic. And then to quickly talk about the coercive idea. This one I'm still working on admittedly. I'm going to tell you this straight up because the coercive idea is something that I find fascinating and really difficult to grapple with because really traditional philosophy, the coercive nature of the state has been grounded on the state's monopolies, uh, monopoly of violence, right? This idea that the state has a monopoly over violence. Um, I tentatively argue that we might need a new definition of coercion or at least a more expansive definition of coercion in this age of technology and the internet where so much of what influences our lives are not really dictated by institutions anymore, at least traditional formal state institutions. But that's maybe for a later paper. Um, but just to talk really quickly about these two conceptions of coercive abilities I've pinpointed. Um, I think big tech is more coercive than state because it exhibits top-down as well as bottom-up coercive authority. So on this top-down side, um, it's actualized through three different measures. One, weakening the state's coercive authority. Two, offering free and cheap services, particularly in developing policies. And three, weaponizing their monopoly power. Um, one quick example of this is that 
In India, Facebook will give you the internet essentially if you kind of use their platform as that basis for that internet. And you know, that's much more expansive and coercive um, than even we see in the United States today. Um, and then finally, this bottom-up coercive idea. Again, this is the one that's a little tricky because you could argue that maybe algorithms and mind hacking techniques are not truly coercive, but I argue that there's something really coercive about it that's really, you know, sinister or, you know, there's something really uh, coercive about this idea. But big tech uses algorithms and mind hacking techniques to keep users addicted to their products. Um, I argue that's a form of coercion. Um, but again, that's something that I'm still working on. And then finally, to talk a little bit about implications of big tech as a macro institution. Um, while some Rawlsians might think that my argument for big tech as a macro institution significantly alters Rawls's basic structure framework, I argue that my argument is really aligned with his framework. Um, this, this distinction between ideal and non-ideal theory is what allows my argument to exist within its framework. That is, I agree with Rawls that corporations should not be a part of the basic structure and not be bound to the principles of justice um, in this like really strict sense that he, def that he you know, requires of these basic structure institutions. Um, they shouldn't be a part of the basic structure and they shouldn't be macro institutions. Forcing corporations to be democratically structured in this very strict way, again, as Rawls sets out, to become institutions of the state, essentially, would eliminate the notion of a private market, almost. Um, this is maybe a plausible option for some people. It's not, it's out of the scope of this paper, personally. Um, but it would just really dramatically alter our market landscape and that's not something I'm ready to propose you know, with this 30-page thesis. Um, but I think in a non-ideal reality world, big tech is a macro institution because of the failure of the state to secure just background conditions and regulate big tech. Um, big tech, like other companies, should re be regulated by the state to become a part of the social fabric that the basic structure institutions govern. In other words, big tech should no longer be big. Um, in the United States, I think a decent starting point would be to sufficiently fund antitrust efforts weakening the monopoly power of big tech. Um, also necessary is really the passage of a really comprehensive and effective national privacy law, giving individuals back their right to their own data. Ultimately, this is the area that I'm hoping to take my research um, this summer and next year. Um, but I think what this paper and this thesis sets up is this framework in which I'm hoping to you know, continue pursuing different lines of research around technology regulation and democratic institutions. And ultimately, rethinking about, maybe we need to rethink some of our political philosophy and our philosophical ideas to fit this 21st century digital age. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for listening. Um, thanks so much for being here. Um, before I begin, I want to say thanks to my amazing research advisor, Professor Julia Lynch, and also everyone at the uh, Andrea Mitchell Center for the support uh, throughout the process of writing this thesis. Um, so my project's titled Called In, Kept Out, Explaining Variation in Construction Trade Union Behavior Towards Migrant Workers in the Advanced Industrial Democracies. and as that might suggest, my main research question was, what explains variation in construction trade union behavior towards migrant workers in skilled construction sectors across the advanced industrialized democratic world? Um, so to go into the methodology and research design, as well as the data collection, um, I used the diverse case selection technique um, and developed a three-dimensional typology of union behavior arguing that construction and trade unions behave, can behave in one of three ways, solidaristically, solidarity dualistically, and exclusionarily. Um, and then from that, I inductively selected my cases to represent the full range of variation on that dependent variable. Um, 
and I found that Denmark, Germany, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, and the Philadelphia Building Trade Unions were that full range of variation. Um, the reason that I kind of was focused on the local level in the United States as opposed to the state level in Europe was that um, in the United States, the building trade unions are organized a little bit differently. So as opposed to having one union federation that organizes all um, construction workers, regardless of their craft trade in the United States, there are individual federations for each craft trade. And then because of that, I thought that there, there was a lot of room for within case variation in the United States in a way that there wasn't in Europe. Um, where I could say something about how a single union federation for all construction workers behaved in Europe, and I could not say the same thing about the United States. Um, so that's why I chose to focus on Philadelphia, because through my research I found that, you know, maybe in Oakland, California, the plumbers act differently than the electricians, but in Philadelphia there was sufficient evidence um, that all of the building trade unions in this city um, behave pretty exclusionarily towards migrant workers, but also um, racial minor minority workers more broadly. Um, so then, um, because of that, because I'm looking at the state level in Europe and I'm just looking at the local level in the United States, I had to kind of narrow my causal why question, um, which led me to ask why did the principal Danish and Norwegian construction trade unions take a more solidaristic path of behavior? towards migrant workers and their union counterparts in Germany, the Netherlands, and Sweden. Um, so to answer that question, I relied on process tracing methods, and um, I also relied on data collection from international organizations like the ILO and the OECD, secondary sources on industrial relations systems, trade unions and collective skill formation systems, as well as in-depth interviews and survey data. Um, so, to do a full process trace, I had to find all of the most plausible rival explanations um, and kind of work to discount those rival explanations to arrive at a main explanatory variable. Um, and to do this, I was relying on a determinist, deterministic understanding of causality. Um, so like if even one, one of my cases from my cross-national evidence uh, refuted one of the hypotheses, I, I argue in the paper that that was enough reason to rule that out. So um, as you can see here, these are kind of my alternative rival explanations um, at the, both the macro and meso levels, um, looking at what explains trade union behavior. Um, and after I ruled all of these out, oops, sorry, um, I arrived at the main hypothesis. Union democracy through deliberative mechanisms most possibly explains why the principal construction trade unions in Denmark and Norway exhibit more solidaristic behavior towards migrant workers than their union counterparts in Germany, the Netherlands, and Sweden. Um, so to kind of break this down, um, this was largely um, building off of the work of Lucio Bucaro, who in 2001 published a dissertation um, arguing that in some instances, in some contexts, based on a match pairs, uh, a match pairs case selection of auto manufacturing plants in Italy. Um, Bacaro finds that more democratic unions won't always necessarily lead to more irresponsible unionism. Um, it can actually lead to more responsible unionism in some cases and contexts where they'll be taking into, um, they'll internalize the interests of third parties, which cru is crucial to my argument because here I'm talking about migrant workers who are a third party outside of these unions. Um, so, uh, to kind of break the argument down, um, I, I measure union democracy um, by looking at whether or not delegates to the union congresses are directly elected, and I argue that this kind of shrinks the representative gap between the rank and file and the state level union leadership. Um, and because of that direct election of the delegates who then go on to elect state level leaders, um, there's kind of a democratically founded trust that emerges in the union. And because of that, because of that trust, when state level leaders decide um, that the union should writ large like pursue an organizing recruitment um, and a solidaristic approach towards migrant workers, um, when they decide to do that because of that trust they have, they'll be more effectively shape and change the preferences of the rank and file through these deliberative mechanisms. And then like because of that, the rank and file members and the local jurisdictions will then go on to kind of internalize 
those more solidaristic ideals and commit their local over resources on the ground to actually realizing and operationalizing these kind of solidaristic uh, approaches towards migrant workers. Um, so you can kind of see in this causal model, um, like in the context of Europeanization, driving increasing migrant migration flows from the east to the west. Um, when you have stronger union democracy through delivery mechanisms, you have more solidaristic behavior and you have Denmark and Norway there. Um, so just a quick note on the Philadelphia Building Trade Union. So as I said, I kind of had to take this out of my causal explanation, but I did have kind of a descriptive chapter just about how they behave. They've, the exclusionary behavior of these unions has persisted since before World War II to the present day. Um, so I kind of did an exploratory investigation of union democracy in the IBW Local 98. Um, which is one of the biggest and most influential building trade unions in Philly. Um, and there's evidence that democratic decision-making procedures are not always, <coughs> excuse me, are not always working as they should based on the recent criminal indictments of several of the leaders uh, for embezzlement and just inappropriate use of union funds. So again, while I'm not trying to argue that this is evidence that every single building trade union in the United States is one exclusionary and two it's because there's a lack of democracy it does kind of point in the direction that there seems to be a lack of democratically founded trust in this union and they do um, behave exclusionarily towards both racial minority workers and migrant workers so um, that was just kind of an exploratory um, chapter that I included at the end of my paper um, and then just some implications in future research directions um, if construction trade unions, especially in Europe, uh, with as migration flows increase, um, if European integration progresses further, um, if they want to take a solidaristic approach towards migrant workers and they realize that, you know, kind of um, the path of solidarity is the most effective approach so that workers together can build power, they may first need to consider organizational forms and democratizing reforms within the union itself. Um, so those are kind of lessons for Germany, the Netherlands, and Sweden. Um, and then also our intersecting frames of identity beyond the migrant identity, a bigger part of the story in Europe. Um, and by that, I kind of mean like the principal construction trade unions in Denmark and Norway did take a more solidaristic approach, but most of those migrant workers coming to Denmark and Norway are still from Eastern Europe. Um, they're still white and Christian, um, and what can be exclusionary behavior of the Philadelphia building trade unions towards migrant workers who are primarily from Latin America and Mexico, as well as native-born um, African-American workers. Like, what does that say about how willing um, these construction trade unions are to organize and take a path of solidarity? I'm not necessarily arguing that there's some sort of threshold, but it's just something for future research to consider, um, which you know, through my review of the literature, seem at least in Europe, seem to be pretty like blind to race and religious identities. Um, yeah, so that's all. Thank you. So it's a real pleasure to be the <coughs> excuse me to be the discussant for this panel on representation and voice in the study of democracy. Um, congratulations on such great senior projects. Um, and it's a pleasure to be back here at the Mitchell Center. Thanks, Jeff, for the invitation. Um, taking together, these three papers illuminate a complex range of questions about democratic politics, its past, present, and future. What's also exciting for me is that they, they exemplify an amazing range of methods for thinking through these questions. We have one paper that's empirical, one that's sort of normative philosophical, and one that's broadly intellectual historical. And though the three projects are focused on really different kinds of cases and use different kinds of approaches, they also speak to each other, I think, in ways that are, that are really interesting. So, so in my remarks um, for the next 15 minutes, I'll say something first about each paper on its own. Um, and then I'll conclude by briefly raising some further questions that emerge for me when we read these three projects together. Um, and I'll just take them in, I'll, initially I'll take them in the order that they were presented. Um, so Chinatza's project gives a rich and compelling overview of some major themes and dilemmas of pre-colonial Igbo political thought. 
The paper reconstructs a complex kind of participatory politics animated by, um, and I quote, the political and social value of autonomy and self-rule, and quote, indigenous form of Igbo democracy not practiced anywhere else. But what's most rewarding in this paper, I think, is how this account of democratic practice is inflected by a deep attention to the complex significance of gender and gendered power, um, which functions simultaneously as a source of hierarchies and as a challenge to them. So my first question here um, about this project is, a, is really a conceptual one about method. Um, one of the ways that you bring the reader into Igbo political thought is by showing how the tradition developed unique perspectives on certain ideas that have, that have long been familiar in other forms um, and in other terms in so-called Western political philosophy. Um, there's a kind of translation linguistically and conceptually that's going on here. Um, I'm thinking in particular of how you use the terms democracy and strike and also sometimes the term boycott. Um, these are old keywords of European political philosophy. Um, but you show that, that there were practices and ideas in Igbo politics that can be expressed with these words as well, um, but which also, in a fascinating way, reshape and revise the meanings of those terms as they're familiar to us. So in your paper, these, these concepts and keywords um, are, are, are transformed and enriched when we look at analogous or similar ideas and practices from the Igbo tradition. But sometimes you refrain from that kind of, of terminological translation, and I'm interested to hear more about why. What I have in mind in particular is the conceptual vocabulary around gender in the paper's discussion of pre-colonial Igbo society. So you write about how, and I quote, gender played a fundamental yet at times flexible role in the ordering of all aspects of Igbo society. And you describe, quote, an understanding of gender as a socio-political tool that could be separated from biological sex through rituals. As a result, as you put it, females could become gendered men socially. So you describe this with the terms gender transition and transformation. A term that you don't use is transgender. So there's an interesting development, I think, in your method of conceptual translation here. It seems that terms like democracy and boycott are sort of readily transferable across different cultural and historical contexts. But maybe a term like transgender identity isn't. Now, this isn't necessarily surprising. right? After all, even if our political categories and concepts um, our sort of social keywords are, are socially constituted and historically specific. Um, they're they're going to be constituted in different ways in every case. And there's no need for, for all of our concepts and keywords to be equally transferable across different contexts. You know, it might just be the case that gender concepts are less transferable across, concept, across different contexts than terms for political forms or tactics. But what I'm interested in here is, is how we understand that kind of difference um, as, as a problem of method. Um, how do you decide when to do that kind of conceptual translation and when to refrain from it? Um, my, my last question for you is a more open-ended one about, I guess, further implications of your argument. Um, the paper operates here in a, in a really rich intellectual historical mode. You give this fascinating account of how Igbo democratic practice involved this constant interplay of well-established social hierarchies and bottom-up kinds of political action. Um, of kinship relations and discourse practices, of labor and status and more. Um, so I, I'd love to invite you to say more about what you think this means for how we should understand democratic politics today. Should the pre-colonial Igbo conception of democracy function for us primarily as a kind of critique of the world that colonialism has made? Should it be a source of normative insights into how we might remake the world that we have? or, or is it, is it, is, is the, does the project have a different kind of significance entirely? Um, your project draws our attention to something significant from the history of democratic politics. And so I, I would love to hear you say more about what it could say to democracy's future. Um, let me move on now to uh, Caitlin's paper, um, which is a really sharp analysis of how the increasing significance of digital technology in our daily lives poses deep challenges for how we understand justice in liberal democratic societies. So Caitlin makes a compelling argument that big tech has become um, what the paper calls a macro institution of the basic structure of society, and that this shouldn't be the case, right? It's a macro institution. It's sort of part of or maybe even more fundamental than the basic structure, but it shouldn't be. The paper, and, and so this means that the paper gives a new kind of argument in favor of certain forms of state regulation of the largest tech companies. So my first question for you, Caitlin, is this. Most fundamentally, has big tech become a macro institution 
as a result of the social implications of technological change or as a result of the political significance of monopolistic power. Your analysis suggests both possibilities, and they could be true at once, at the same time, of course, but I'm curious to hear you say more about how you understand the relationship between them. So for example, in the last paragraph of the section on top-down coercive authority, um, you write that, quote, big tech utilizes its monopolistic status to coerce individuals to use big tech products. And then you go on to say that the use of such tech products is, quote, a near necessity because of the widespread nature of big tech in our society today. So social media, for example, has become, as you put it, the public square of the digital age. So here on one side, we have monopoly power, right? The ability of certain companies to basically make their own rules because of how successful their anti-competitive practices have been. But on the other hand, we have something different, or at least a little bit different, which is the way that technological change, like social media, has transformed social relations in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, these two sides are obviously really closely interconnected, socially and empirically, historically. But at least conceptually and analytically, they're, they're potentially separable. In your own view, is one more fundamental than the other? Should regulation address them separately or together? If the social transformations brought about by technology are the real problem for the Rawlsian basic structure, then would antitrust regulation be enough? After all, having several dozen social media sites competing with each other might still sort of restructure the nature of the digital public square in troubling or complex ways, even if it's no longer a problem of the Facebook monopoly itself. Now second, jumping off that language of coercion that I referenced, um, I found really interesting the, the argument that you make about the philosophical idea of coercion. You suggest that big tech has a kind of bottom-up coercive power that has no parallel in Rawlsian theory. Um, but you also argue that the standard, quote, philosophical definition of coercion is too narrowly conceived to properly encompass what coercion looks like in the digital technology age. So the traditional philosophical emphasis on actors and institutions, for example, you argue can't account for the kinds of power, coercive power, that um, operates, for example, through, through algorithms and personally. And you, you said a little bit about this in the presentation, too. I found the suggestion really convincing. And so I wanted to invite you to say more about this and about whether you think other fundamental political concepts are also being transformed in this kind of way. Would you want to make similar arguments about concepts like speech and expression, for example, or about privacy itself? You know, you talked about the, re about the regulation of speech on social media um, and about the need for privacy protections, um, but you didn't take up as explicitly the question of whether those terms themselves might also be sort of n needed to be understood in new ways like, um, like you do with coercion. Um, yeah, so, so I wanted to sort of ask you to, to, to say more about that and what the implications of, of, of shifts to those concepts might be as well. Um, Brennan's paper uh, makes a real contribution to our understanding of the relationship between migrant labor and union politics. What I found really compelling was how the paper presents this range of possible explanations for different levels of union solidarity with migrant workers um, and evaluates the options so carefully in the different national contexts. It's a really rich and compelling story. Um, and the suggestions that you make for how further research could build on your results to, to study union politics in Philadelphia and elsewhere in the United States are, are really convincing. Um, my first question for you has to do with migrant workers as political actors. We're introduced in, in your thesis to many ways in which labor unions operate, how they exercise agency and navigate wider social conditions. But what about migrant workers themselves? What role do they play in the development of labor strategy and in the transformation of union politics? The paper gives an insightful account of how unions do or don't try to organize groups of migrant workers. But I was left wondering what role migrant workers themselves play in this story. Are there cross-national differences that you found in how migrant workers respond to union organizing? Do migrants ever play a part in, in, in initiating the campaigns that demand greater solidarity from labor unions or that push them to change their strategies? Um, basically, in your view, does the, does the political agency of migrant workers have explanatory significance for understanding how union attitudes and labor strategies shift and develop over time? Now, this, this takes me to a second question, which is about the kind of causal argument that you're giving here. Um, 
as, as part of your argument that more democratically structured unions are more solidaristic with, with migrant workers than less democratic ones, and I found that argument really compelling, um, you, you assess a number of rival hypotheses. Um, you know, maybe, maybe it's the case that mil more militant unions are more solidaristic, or maybe unions are more solidaristic when, when national immigration policy is more generous. Um, and, and you show really effectively that, that the, the sort of thesis about democratic structure of unions can explain all five national cases, and that none of the other rival theses on its own can account for all five in the same way. Um, but I was curious about the possibility, um, a possibility that I think is still left open a little bit um, here, which, which has to do with, with the, the possibility that there might be multiple causal pathways through which solidarity could be produced, um, or the possibility that solidarity could be produced through combinations of, of multiple of these causal factors, none of which are individually significant. Um, you, you, you look at each possible hypothesis on its own, but there's less attention here to the sort of interactions between them. But, um, the way that different causal pathways might um, interact to produce outcomes even when none of them could do it sort of individually. Um, so I, I, was, I was totally convinced by your argument that none of these other factors was a necessary and sufficient condition in itself for solidaristic organizing to happen. But I'm, I'm curious to hear more from you about, about what you've learned about how they, they might interact with, with each other and what that might sort of mean for, the, for carrying this research to other contexts as well. And this takes me to the final question on this project, which is about the conditions for union democracy itself. You build a really strong case for the claim that union democracy produces solidarity with migrant workers. And this left me wondering, like, why are some unions more democratic than others in the first place? Um, I know this question is, is sort of outside the scope of the project um, as you're taking it up here, but I wanted to invite you to say more um, in any way you'd want to about what you've learned from this project um, about the conditions for, for union democratization um, and what that, what implications that might have for the politics of migrant labor in Europe and the United States. So I want to conclude with uh, three brief questions that emerge from reading these papers together for me. Um, and each is directed to sort of a combination of two, of two papers. Um, first on, uh, let's see, on Chance's paper and Brendan's. Um, Gender dynamics are central to the story about Igbo democracy um, that we get here. Um, they're not as prominent in the story about construction trade unions. Um, how should we understand the significance of gender dynamics in labor politics today? I think both projects have something to say about the terms we might bring to that question and the, and the tools we might have to study it. Um, and you know what the what the the project on on. Um, Igbo democracy, I think, reveals is the range of concepts of democracy that, avail that are available for us to think about democratic politics today. Um, in Brendan's project, we get, a, we get a particular way of thinking about democratic governance and labor unions. It's a compelling way um, in terms of de deliberative mechanisms and electoral representation. Um, do you think this is the only way in which unions can be, can be democratic? How do we decide between competing accounts of democratic practice? How do we assess whether a particular institutional form is sufficiently democratic or not? This is where the sort of study of the history of, of, of democratic practices in various contexts, I think, um, come, you know, can be brought to bear on, on contemporary questions about, about democratic organizing. And I think both of you would have a lot to say about this kind of question. Um, second, a question for uh, Chinatza and for Caitlin. Um, what is the study of, of pre-colonial and indigenous political thought um, contribute to our understanding of, of the, the very idea of the basic structure of society? Um, what do you think Rawlsian liberalism can learn from Igbo democracy? And how should an anti-colonial politics situate itself between ideal theory and non-ideal theory? Um, on the flip side, it, it, it seems to me that Igbo democracy is something to offer for how we understand the politics of online social spaces today, actually. Um, this, this wouldn't be as obvious from the presentations, but um, I, I, was, I was really struck by the, by the, the, the discussion you gave, Chinatza, of um, what you call the, the sitting on practice, where groups of people would sort of gather outside a single person's home and, and, and sort of it, it, almost in a practice of public shaming or calling out. And it, and it seemed to me that it, you know, had something to say for the debates that sort of s operate today under the, 
the sort of heated language of like cancel culture or whatever, you know, platforming, deplatforming, shame politics. Um, this is a totally different kind of historical and cultural context that maybe allows us to rethink some of the assumptions that we bring to those, those questions today. Um, finally, a question directed jointly to, to Brendan and Caitlin. Um, what role do unions have in responding to the unprecedented power of big tech companies? Um, you talked about this a little bit, Caitlin, but um, you know, I, I'm curious to hear about you know, whether the kinds of democratization strategy, strategies that we learn, learn about um, in, in Brendan's piece, you know, what, what, this, what this sort of, sort of promises as, as, a, as a sort of bottom-up alternative to top-down regulation of, of tech companies, um, or, or do you think that, that big tech today presents political dilemmas that are really just sort of beyond what labor politics can, can take on? Um, on the flip side, how has technological change shifted the politics of migration? Um, you know, I'm, I'm curious about whether you, you saw anything on, the, on this level in, in the sort of, sort of you know, over the years analysis that you were doing, Brendan. Um, you know, there's an obvious set of dilemmas here about the online circulation of extreme rhetoric, of xenophobia on social media, um, and so on. But there's another set of dilemmas, too, that come out of how the digital revolution has changed the relationship between geography and labor. In some sense, the outsourcing of jobs involved in technological infrastructure is the flip side of migrant labor in jobs involved in physical infrastructure. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious to hear from both of you about how technology is changing what labor organizing can do um, and how labor itself is organized as a result around the globe. So congratulations to all three of you for these projects. Um, I know I've given you a lot of very open-ended questions and, so, and we don't have much time, but um, I would love to hear you know, in, in anything you want to add to, to what you've said already. Um, and I'm sure there are questions from the audience too. So thank you. Yeah, and that's something, definitely something that, like, I would, if I had infinite time and resources, would have explored more. Um, and, you know, just for future research that I may do, um, just taking a look at how ex exploring, like, interacting effects um, might be a good step. Um, and then, yeah, in terms of, like, so some of the... Um, it, kind of like the agency of migrant workers themselves. Some of the interviews I did with Danish construction unionists were really illuminating and kind of uh, shed light on the pretty like criminal and co like abusive and coercive and threatening behavior of like employers, like construction employers and hiring agencies, like temp agencies who bring in posted workers from primarily the Baltic states and Eastern European mm -hmm. states. Um, and it really does rob like these workers of a lot of agency because there is such a like strong fear within them that they will either get deported, something will happen to their families back home um, if they try to stand up for their own rights. Um, so that's why the unions are like so so important to kind of not only like wake like wake up the conscious the political and kind of solidaristic consciousness of these workers. It's also to like kind of give them a shield to exercise their own agency, if that makes sense. Um, and that was also, it's, it's, it was an interesting, like, parallel to some of the labor organizing work I've done in Philadelphia. Um, not so much with, like, deportation issues, but just kind of, like, that need to, that, this, the parallel trends of the end goal of organizing, um, even, like, across borders, I thought was, was, interesting to learn about and then like last point I just I definitely think that um, in terms of labor and big tech um, which I think was a great point you brought uh, Caitlin about how like big tech companies are terrified right now of organized labor and they're spending millions and millions of dollars 
to avoid labor unions um, because it you know messes up their business models it messes up uh, their profits it you know their their workers are beginning to organize and I think to the point about union democracy I think this is kind of this is speculation but I I think there has been a lot of talk um, in organizing communities that like one of the reasons Amazon labor union was so successful was in Staten Island was because it was a labor union like made up of and run by and led by the workers themselves um, and that seems like a pretty like democratic you know way to go about organizing and it was pretty effective so yeah um, yeah I, I really appreciated your questions it's really interesting quickly on a few of those points um, and your point about like the ubiquity like the individual it just like ubiquity of tech versus this monopolistic power of big tech. I see it as like the immediate concern, at least in my perspective, and the reason why I focus on big tech is like this is a big problem that's like right now focused and that we, you know, I think the first step would be to be more effective with antitrust and then obviously I don't think that's where it should end. But I think the long-term danger of technology in general and the privatization specifically of technology is this very ubiquitous nature of technology. And so that's where the long-term argument, I think, is for increased tech regulation and for making sure that all ethical practices, or all tech practices are ethical. Because I, I'm not of the type to say we should ban and like, you know, constrain these technological innovations just simply be cognizant of the ubiquitous nature of those. Um, second on your point about the coercive new philosophical concept, I'm happy you liked it because it's something I've been struggling with for months of like, it's not really this coercive thing how we can traditionally conceive of it, right? It's just like this new idea, but I had this like really strong feeling that like, there's something about it that just like doesn't seem to fit with this traditional definition of coercion that, you know, we've been talking about it for decades in philosophical terms. Um, I'm still working on it. That's like where I would like to do my research next in the summer and next year. Um, but yeah, I think the new course of nature just can't be so closely tied to these really formal institutions. There has to be something else. I'm, I'm going to hopefully read a lot more about that and figure that out. In terms of speech and privacy, um, I also think there needs to be new conceptions, maybe not so like further removed from uh, traditional definitions because I think speech and privacy are so tightly related to the state. But um, it, I've been reading a lot more like Frankfurt School legal sociology these days and this guy named Gunther Tubner he has this whole idea of like we should have constitutions for other s social spheres rather than just the state, you know, so like culture, education, the economy should have constitutions essentially um, like the state does. And, I don't know, that idea has been percolating a little bit and maybe we should have some sort of constitution idea for speech and privacy as well. Um, totally about your, the pre-colonial thought and basic structure argument. Um, what I've really liked about Chanaza's description in just the past year listening to your project is just this focus on democracy as like a very non-ideal theory. Like, I don't know, just a very like practical, like this is the historical conception and this is how we should conceive of democracy. I think. I think that's something the basic structure could use more of, maybe less ideal theory type of conception and theorizing and more like, how does this actually impact, you know, day-to-day -day lives and there's something significant about that. Um, and then quickly with unions and big tech. Um, I think what I've learned from Brendan's presentations over this year has been that, you know, Ultimately, there can be so much institutional force. You could have something as huge as Amazon coming up against a small unionizing force in Staten Island. But when you have like the power of the people really behind you, the power of the workers, like there's very little that can actually stop this unionizing force. So um, just big takeaway. It's like, you know, institutional power and money really only gets you so far if there's like a true will to unionize against. Um, so yeah, that's something that I've been thinking about in the past few weeks post the Staten Island unionization effort. Um, yeah, like really great questions as everyone said, and I'll just touch briefly on some of that. Um, in terms of the question that you had about like gender and the way that I described it, um, I, I describe it in that manner because I don't think that the transition or transformation that gender women and males in um, Igbo society make could be like 
directly correlated to contemporary ideals of like transgender identity um, and those transformations were more so for like political reasons um, and like reflect the way that gender could be used as like a political tool for like advantage or um, to like you know, gain more advantage. Um, but I do use like similar words to describe democracy because that is like what we're seeing um, when I say that like Igbo women, you know, did boycotts and strikes. Like they did boycott their work and they did strike against their work in order to like get a certain result. Um, and they did sort of like practice this like pure democracy and so that kind of like leads into like what are the implications of this and um, I think the implications are just so vast when Europeans came to Nigeria and like when they saw Igbo land they were just like so confused on how these group of people could organize themselves in this manner and like exist in this manner and you know Igbo people were not like highly militaristic and they were surrounded by a bunch of like kingdoms on all corners and yet they re they retained their independence and sovereignty for 6000 years and I was really curious as to like what are they practicing and upholding for themselves and even just in like the structure of like Igbo politics where it's um I really think a direct like clash against the nation state and you break people down to like groups of hundreds of people and then everyone has like access and like a direct connection into like what happens for everyone and that idea of like having no king of having no other group of people being able to like you know infringe on your autonomy is really important um so i think the implications are just really one as we're looking at like the effects and globalization of colonization as we're thinking of new worlds, um, what the past world could tell us of like different formations. Um, and then really quickly, lastly, in terms of like the sitting on thing and cancel culture, um, cancel culture is like not a new thing. And um, for evil people, especially people that like didn't rely heavily on like a police state, a huge thing was like social shame and that was like how society kind of like held its place so the ability to shame someone um really you know it had a lot of big deal if a bunch of women did that and like revealed their nakedness and all of that thing like that could cause someone to commit suicide um so it's just um they did practice cancel culture <laughs> basically and yeah they would shame people um, if they like violated a rule. But yeah, thank you so much for the great questions. Um, thank you everyone for your great papers. I had um, sort of comments and maybe a couple of questions. Um, Chinasa, your um, presentation was great, your paper was great. I think you will find a companion in anthropologi an anthropologist called Maria Mies. I don't know if you know her. She wrote a book called Patriarchy and Accumulation on a World Scale. And she basically talks about, it's, it's a case study of uh, a few African countries and she talks about how tribal Africa was more democratic and anti-patriarchal and contemporary understandings than it was before colonization and how colonization actually um, turned Africa into um, basically an uninhabitable en environment for ideas that came from tribal culture and tribal societies. Um, she also talks about the relationship between imperial and colonial Europe and capitalism. And I think that that could really help your, take your paper um, forward, especially the way that she structures her book. It, it's honestly one of my favorite anthropological studies. Um, I had a question for Caitlin. So Caitlin, I think your research is super cool. Um, you might wanna rethink how you're defining democracy maybe because a lot of what I heard when you were presenting was 
big tech has a lot of influence, right? So what really is democracy and what role is big tech playing and how are these two reconciled? That's my first uh, question. Did you really think about, you know, is democracy, can we still talk about democracy when we talk about the world today with big tech and sort of this breakdown of uh, the understanding of sovereignty that traditionally comes with democracy, the rule of law and the rule of the state? Um, what is this intimate relationship that exists, if at all, between big tech and democratic institutions, right? And which one precedes which? The second thing I wanted to talk about was your definition of coercion. I really like that discussion. I think you'll find a lot of people who are on your side with redefining coercion, especially in feminist theory and queer theory. Uh, because a lot of times when we think about co coercion, we also think about consent, right? Because when you're talking about coercion, you're talking about a sort of lack of consent. And how do you really define consent? I think if you, if you look at feminist literature, at um, queer theory, you'll find a lot of people who are rethinking understandings of coercion. Uh, but also, I, I, wanna, I wanna invite you to rethink whether you're really thinking about coercion or violence and how you're differentiating between the two. In terms of violence, there are a lot of theorists like uh, Fanon, who's an anti-colonial theorist, I'm sure you've heard of him, uh, Slavoj Žižek, who's a critical theorist, who have rethought this idea that violence is only, only intersubjective and talked about how violence can also be structural and psychic. Um, so maybe, I, I'm sure you do want to talk about coercion. I actually agree with you that this is a topic about coercion, but maybe try to differentiate the two in, in your research. Uh, Brendan. Really great topic, very timely. Um, I did want to ask about how you're using Europe, right? Because Europe is so diverse. So when you're talking about Europeanization uh, in your research, what Europe are you thinking about? Are you thinking about Eastern Europe, Western Europe, Scandinavian Europe? And uh, the, the second thing I wanted to say was just a comment. When you were presenting, you said that trade unionists in uh, Scandinavian countries don't really care about race or religion, right? when thinking about solidarity. I maybe want to invite you to think or rephrase this into saying things like they care more about class than something else. Um, or maybe talk about your variables. Maybe I misunderstood something. I'd love to hear more about what you're saying uh, in terms of the solidarity that came out of that and why uh, Philadelphia didn't fit your model, right? If you can talk a bit more about why it didn't fit the model. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, so lovely to be here. I have a former student on the panel, Caitlin. Um, I won't be uh, biased, uh, but all three were really lovely. Um, really interesting. I have a million questions, but I'm going to keep it short and snappy. Um, one thing I thought that was super interesting was the um, uh, scope of the three papers together. Um, thinking about um, the violence of colonization, um, the delocation of big tech, um, and of course migrant workers um, in a bunch of different places. Like this is a huge scope. Uh, <laughs> thinking about what, what democracy is and, and where is it um, is a difficult question, but I want to ask like, does democracy exist today? And if so, where? Um, <laughs> Is it located in a particular state? Is that a stupid question? Do we need to be thinking about boundaries and spaces and nations when we're talking about democracy? Um, and I'm optimistic about the future because of you three, but um, I'm wondering if you are optimistic about democracy going forward. Um, <laughs> good. That is a huge question. I love it, Audrey. <laughs> Keep it snappy. Totally. Great question. <laughs> um, likewise, I loved all three of these presentations, and I was surprised at how well they uh, read into one another, as I think Matt really brought out. They're, time, they're crossing time, but they have a lot in common um, in a surprising way. So some specific questions um, that I don't think we'll probably have time for, but I was, Chimaza, I was really interested in uh, something that I thought I heard you say, that everyone is a citizen. And I was really struck by this when you said that next to this idea of all of these nested hierarchies and that wonderful chart that you put up. So I was curious how you're thinking about you slash Igbo folks are thinking about citizenship as it relates to these hierarchies. 
and whether we're talking about maybe a differentiated citizenship or these opportunities to move, which you, using gender, talked about, these opportunities to move t into different types of citizenship. So I was curious to hear how you're conceptualizing that. Um, okay, quickly, Kate Wong, I thought um, you invoked Elizabeth Anderson really briefly um, and noted that she has an idea that we can maybe make corporations democratic. Um, and I think, if I remember her argument, it's that she wants some uh, representation by workers on the governance boards of corporations. And I was curious to hear a little bit more about why you think this is not a viable solution for regulation, if that's what your position was. Um, but then also to hear a little bit more about um, a comparison to other contexts. Europe has pretty rigorous privacy rules when it comes to regulating tech. Do you see those as successful, or how do you not see those as successful to the degree that you think they should be? And then lastly, um, I mean, thank you also, you brought up this idea of trust in union democracy. And I was curious to hear how you're conceptualizing trust, and how is it that it is trust related to this idea of representation, that I see myself as represented, therefore I have trust, or, uh, yeah, so I'll just leave it there. How are you thinking about trust and how it um, maybe drives towards greater solidarity, or is that the vector that you're drawing for us? Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you for all the great questions and the suggestions for books. I love reading, so I'll check that out. Um, in terms of the question about uh, democracy and whether or not it exists today, um, <laughs> I think it's a hard question to ask, but I definitely um, think that the influence of big tech is really like pushing on the bounds of like democracy. Um, just really the ability, like so many people are using the internet and using these apps and mediums for communication, to get news, to get all sorts of things. And like, it's low-key just kind of insane how like, how little regulation that there is, how much like data and information that these companies can get. So I think that like really rethinking and in, inserting big tech into like our institutions and into re like regulatory practices is like really a pinnacle thing for like a pivotal thing for a democracy right now to like handle um and then um in relation to your question about like the hierarchies and things like that um i think evil pre-colonial evil people would define citizenship in terms of kinship so everyone in the in the village is related to each other in one way or the other through marriage or birth. Um, and so by virtue of being related, you have a voice to speak. Um, but this is um, kind of like influenced by different factors, as you mentioned. And so it, I think it's kind of like in the way that um, we kind of think about like common experiences today where I don't know you might expect like an older person to like have more knowledge and wisdom so you'd grant them more attention and like more of like a epistemic like advantage in like knowledge but um if a younger person was able to like really speak well and convince people of their argument that is also valid so like these divisions and hierarchies can be overcome by like being like speaking well, being really influential, being well, like being able to like argue and translate your message and convince others. So they're not like insurmountable, but they do like color people's experiences. Great. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Okay, um, what do I answer? Um, one, I am just starting to think about the course of ideas, so thank you so much for all your tips. I actually read Fanon in Audrey's class, so um, uh, I kind of forgot about like, I don't know, I, I didn't even think to even apply his ideas to a political theory, like this political big tech Rawlsian framework, because I don't know, I guess it felt so separated in my head. So I'm definitely going to look into it and thank you and think about that idea of like, how do you rethink violence in relation to coercion? And, you know, there are, you know, maybe big tech in traditional sense isn't enacting this violence type of coercion, but I certainly think there are like corollaries or things that are just as significant. So that's pretty much my next project coming from this paper. Um, 
Does democracy exist today? If so, where? Massive question. Um, I think it's been significantly weakened. I haven't lost hope completely. I think the really core part of it and the real critical pin, linchpin of like having democracy succeed and you know strengthen one day is deregulation of big tech specifically. That's why I'm really passionate about the issue. Um, it might be stronger in other areas and regions like the EU, um, which I think Rawls, if he was alive today, would say so. Um, and I think you know his the closest model to his idea of democracy is probably existing in like a Scandinavian type um, stronger welfare state type uh, country. Um, I think we're actually all heading to Europe next year, so we'll all be explaining or looking into that a little bit. Um, but yeah, that's what I'll be researching next year in Europe, looking at tech regulation and philosophy. Um, and then Anderson, I don't mean to say like we shouldn't democratize internal structured governance. I think we should, and I agree with Anderson on that. I just think it needs to go, I don't think I'm get ready to give up on the idea of like, in my head, making big tech a part of the basic structure would make it like a state run entity. And there's already so much like, kind of icky stuff between the state and big tech with surveillance power and stuff that I didn't want to like, you know, have the state being like, oh, the state's this unmitigated good that can regulate. You know, they've also contributed a lot to this huge influence of big tech. So I think it has to go beyond just this like, oh, if we can democratize these big tech states internally, we'll be good. I think it has to go like, no, we have to regulate them in a really forceful and structural way. Um, but yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm also happy to just chat after for like overtime, but um, oh yeah, um, yeah, just um, oh sorry, okay, um, yeah, I I feel like I can't really answer those questions like very in a brief manner, but they were like really good questions um, and definitely something um, you know can think about and also just like for future research maybe not revisiting this one, but like in terms of how you can better conceptualize things and how conceptualization is so important to an argument and like, um, you know, just thinking about what you mean and being very intentional about the language that you use. Um, so thank you for those comments. Um, All right. Thank you for this really energetic first panel.